Welcome to DCTV. Last but not least, fasten your seatbelts and come along as we chop it up with some of the funniest comedians from all around the globe. Here at LNL, we do everything with a twist. We'll have the stand ups sit down and allow us to get to know the real folks behind the funny. That's right, we're getting all up in their business. So if you're hungry for humor and need a good laugh, you've stopped at the right place. Welcome up here, Queen Mother of Black Hollywood. <laughs> this is Hollywood. Okay, so why did I tell you? <laughs> I roll like I roll. I was born and raised in a little town called Kenlock, Missouri. Sometimes I didn't have food. I sang my first solo in church. The reaction of the congregation told me I was an entertainer. Because I didn't just sing, I sang. <laughs> Five years old. My mother was a wonderful woman, though. She was wonderful in that she kept us fed, clothed, and sheltered. Women, black women back then didn't have time for a lot of affection and coddling. And I didn't get it. And I got mad. I was the baby of seven, and I was mad. I was like, Mama, see me, see me, Mama. And that turned into, see me, I was mad. And then it turned into, oh, you're going to see me. The diva was born. I became captain of the cheerleading squad, president of my class. I went to college. Told mama I was going to quit college. Honey, she pulled up in that car. She said, I didn't scrub those white people's toilets for you to quit. Y'all can't applaud everything I say. <laughs> but guess what? Carry on. And I stayed in college. Honey, I got my degree. I gave it to her. She put it on the wall. I went to New York and got my first Broadway show within 11 days of graduating from college. Thank you. But then I was bipolar and didn't know it. They passed a box of cocaine around. This is the um, early 80s, yeah. I was at a party in San Francisco passing the box out, and I asked the guy I was with, I said, what's that? He said, oh, baby, that's coke. I said, how do you do it? <laughs> Dumbass. I said, how you do it? He said, well, you snore a little bit up there, and you know. I said, then what happens? He said, well, then you feel a drip in the back of your throat. I said, a drip? <laughs> Any kids in here? Good. Oh, no, I'm talking about babies, because <laughs> I'm going to be doing some cussing. Wait a minute, y'all. Look, this is what I said to him. He said, there's a drip down your throat, the back of your throat. I said, nigga, ain't shit going on my throat. I got a matinee tomorrow. But my point being, my point being, my dream was more important than getting high. I let nobody get in my way and don't think people didn't try. There's a lot of meanness out in the world, a lot of evil. Gotta be careful. But you ain't got to get none on you. You keep it moving. You stay positive. Don't be gossiping and judging other people. You be nice to people, but you be careful who you give your heart to. After I got my Broadway show, I realized I didn't know now I had a sexual addiction. You have to read about in a book, honey. I ain't going into all that. <laughs> but I say to people, ain't no shame. And they said, Jennifer, why you tell all that? I said, honey, ain't no shame in my game. Yeah, I did it. I slept with all of them. <laughs> Would I do it again? No. It was so dangerous. 
all those dark rooms with those men, strange men. And I was young. I was just, you know, carrying on. And thank God I was at least selective. I didn't catch anything because, honey, when Walter Cronkite said, you've slept with everybody they've slept with for the last seven years, I was like, well, I'm a dead bitch. I told my girlfriend, I said, book me a trip around the world and put it on a credit card. Because I'm going to be dead in about five minutes. All that acting out I did. But I made it through. All right. But I lost a lot of friends to that disease. It was a silent war that was never declared. 200 I knew. So after the AIDS epidemic, my father died from a massive heart attack and my grief was just too great. I had a nervous breakdown, screaming and hollering on the floor, everybody was dead. And a girlfriend, a good girlfriend, she looked at me, she said, Jenny, something's wrong. I said, okay, I'll go. Because I was like, oh, bitch, I'm Jennifer Lewis. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with me. Going no damn therapy. But I went. Two things will change a human being. Only two things. One, got to have a near-death experience. Number two, you just got to get sick and tired of being sick and okay. tired. Got to get tired of the same shit over and over and over. Then you change. I look in the mirror and say, that's enough. And that's what I did. <sighs> My career began to soar. I've done 300 episodic television shows, 68 movies, four Broadway shows. And I've toured in concert all over the world. I became the mother of black Hollywood. I got what's love got to do with it. Preacher's wife, Tupac Shakur, poetic justice, and on and on and on. And even then, it wasn't easy. It took me 17 years. It took my shrink five years to convince me to go on medication. I'm like, oh, baby, don't take my edge. It doesn't take my edge. I'm fine. I'm doing great. So I wrote this book. Hmm. To tell you, you can come through the fire. Come out of those dark rooms. Because somebody touched you inappropriately. Don't sit in there and eat yourself to death and drink yourself to death. You tell somebody. Something hurt you, go somewhere and cry and scream. Whatever you got to do, get it out. Get up. Get up and keep moving. I gave up many times. I did. But I didn't quit. Testing. Why did the girl ask the mushroom to dance? Because he was a fun guy. Go on, Mocha. Well, all right. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was enthralled. I was, I'm on the edge of my seat. Well, can we talk about mental health in the black community? Can we talk about why we don't talk about it, why we don't do anything, and what can we do? All right, listen, y'all. There's a stigma, mental illness, taboo, stigma of the shock treatment and straight jackets. Shock treatment. Uh-uh, get that baby out of here. Don't bring that baby in here. I'm just kidding. Come here, girl. Come here. 
get back in there. Come and grab them. No, grab them. I'm kidding. Get them back in here. Come on now. You better have something to stick in her ears. <laughs> How you doing? What time's your ticket say? <laughs> Sit your ass down. Oh, I mess with everybody. And don't get up and go to the bathroom. <laughs> I tell people, you come to see Jennifer Lewis, you wear it depends. <laughs> Ooh, I love myself. You be careful with that baby now. Don't let her hear too many cuss words. They, they, what, they on that internet, honey. What she say? Wait, one person tell me, what? Oh, she used to? <laughs> she be cussing at that baby. Y'all be nice to these kids. Y'all love y'all children. Love them real good. Oh my God, I'm gonna tell y'all right now. And this is real. Had I been loved as a child, I'd be president of the United States. <laughs> Nothing would have stopped me. But guess what? I grew up and realized my mother did the best she could. And I had to be forgiving in my own heart. She instilled education in us. She taught me work ethics. She gave me what she could. And I honor her in that book. The first three words are Dorothy May Lewis was not a woman to mess with. And y'all know I didn't want to write mess. <laughs> I was trying to be nice, honey. The editor was like, Jennifer, do you have to cuss every <laughs> sentence? And I said, I'll be all right if it's just a little. But let's get back to mental illness. Um, one thing I have learned is that the churches, the black churches are beginning to have meetings and counseling for people who need help. And I wanna say thank you to those establishments. Y'all come off of that. You got a cousin, listen to me, you got a cousin that jumps up on the table at the family reunion, that aunt that lives in the basement and never comes out, that sister or brother that's always in drama road rage, carrying on, screaming and hollering, something's wrong. Act like you know and reach out your hand. But if they ain't ready to be helped, keep it moving. Because it'll wear you out. You can't, you can't run nobody else's life. You ain't in their shoes, so don't even try. I'll tell you what I learned after worrying about my daughter when she didn't speak to me for two years. You don't own nobody. You can't control nobody. And be careful trying to rescue them. You are in your own mind and head and shoes. shoes. You are in your shoes, nobody else. Even if you land next to somebody in a bed at night, they sleep. You the one up like this. So somebody told me this, it's kind of crazy, but it kind of jumped out at me too. He said, life is just standing in a room all alone talking to yourself. I was, I was like, bitch, what the fuck? <laughs> but it's kind of true. We get to choose how we react to things. And life is just moving on around us. So I, I choose to be happy. Not all the time, y'all, ain't nothing perfect about me. My shit stinks, but guess what? You sit in it too long and stop smelling. You walk away from that negativity. Walk away from it, y'all, we got something to do. We got a lunatic in the White House. We got work to do, but it starts right with you. Taking care of yourself so you, your arms will be, see that's what my daughter, I wanted my arms to be strong when she falls because God knows she was going to fall. We all fall. So with the mental illness, come on 
y'all. We ain't got to be scared of that no more. Wake up. Wake up and help somebody. Get somebody to the therapist's office. And I don't be talking about I can't afford it. It's America. There's people. You go to a college where those psych, uh, uh, psychology students are, are doing their internship. You want to get well, you can get well, but you got to want to. And stop all them excuses. There are a lot of therapists that will give you a, a scale to meet what you can pay. You tell somebody, stop being afraid. Come out of them dark rooms, y'all. Oh, I'm so glad I came out of that shit. I, I got to tell you, I'm so grateful. I am. I lived my dream. Look at this. I'm in a theater right now. Hey, ain't nobody up there. Hey, I, <laughs> I didn't say I haven't gone crazy. <laughs> Next question. Who's got a question? Don't be scared of me. What, baby? Uh uh, let, let's stand up. And talk loud. It's actually a comment. I just wanted to say, my daughter, she would have been 27. She was bipolar when she was 13. When she was about 16 or 17, she heard you talking about your bipolar. And it made her feel a little bit more comfortable with her treatment. Um, she didn't get all the way better. She's passed away. But I just want, I've always wanted to meet you just to tell you thank you for giving my daughter that little bit of time to feel it more. Okay. Well, now that um, you know, when they called me to go on the Oprah Winfrey show to talk about bipolar disorder, you know, I, they went out. Little girl, they used to call me Little Crazy Jenny. When they told me it's bipolar, I said, "Oh, you white people gave it a name, did you?" <laughs> I said, "By what?" I said, I'm bi-coastal. <laughs> I'm a bisexual. Oh, yeah, no. don't, don't, don't. Come. Now, y'all know I'm lying. There's a chapter in the book called Dick Diva. <laughs> All right, it was that one time in Chicago, wasn't it? A hot mess. <laughs> but when I, when Oprah called and asked me, okay, she didn't call her assistant call. <laughs> I told them, they called, they said, Miss Lewis, this, we're calling from the Oprah Winfrey show. We were wondering if you, I said, bitch, how you get this number? <laughs> you know what she said? Like I said, it's Oprah. <laughs> now y'all know the FBI gave Oprah my number. <laughs> And that morning when I arrived at the Oprah Winfrey Studios in Chicago, I was so nervous. Oprah Winfrey. But I said to myself, I may be in her arena, but she's in my territory. I've suffered with this disease all my life. And she was so gracious. She made me feel safe to tell the world. But it was only after I got treatment that I had a voice to say it worked for me. I'm sorry about your baby. She just, she just sleep at peace now. God bless you. Wow. Next question. What would you say your biggest breakthrough was in the business, in life? My greatest accomplishment with all that I have done is I joined the Big Sister Big Brother program while I was having my own therapy and working through 
my bipolar disorder. I became a little girl named Miss Charmaine. I became her big sister for five years, and when she turned 12, her mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and could no longer raise her. Well, I love that little baby. I didn't know anything about being a mother, but I knew I loved her. And I had enough money to give her a good, good education. And with love, lead with love, wherever you go. But that was my greatest hour when I said, come on, baby. I'll do my best. She's 30 years old now. Mm -hmm. She was seven when I met her. And she's at home right now with my little puppy and my little cat. Mm -hmm. And she sends me pictures every day. Makes me so happy. It's the small things. It is your humanity that will matter. Oh, y'all can sing and dance and act and be funny and be cute. But who are you in here? Are you making a difference in the world? See, that's why I'm here. My dream, I got my dream. I worked hard and got it. Famous, rich, oh, don't ask me for no money. <laughs> 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 but I did it. Little girl didn't have no food to eat. Barefoot. Poor and hungry. No hot water. Had to use the outhouse. At night you had to do, use the bucket. My little booty froze on the, the little wood, to, you know, to, to, to use the bathroom. It was so sad. It was. I got five bathrooms now. <laughs> yeah, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> but you do your best and leave the rest. Don't try to take on all of it. Step by step. Put one foot in front of this tour has made me so exhausted. Because I'm going up from city to city, television, radio. I'm tired right now. But when I see your faces, I'm lit. Because I got something to do. This is my time to give my heart and soul to some beautiful children. It means everything to me. Y'all watching Blackish? Yes. 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 <laughs> Ruby Johnson, you think she's crazy enough? I didn't run the car into the garage. <laughs> Scamming people. Throwing people's boats up. <laughs> I'm having the time of my life, and the cast is just great. I love Tracy and Anthony and Lawrence Fishburne. Morpheus from The Matrix. <laughs> Come on now. People say, oh, Jennifer, how is it working with Lawrence Fishburne? I say, it's ice cream, cotton candy, and Christmas morning. Yeah. I'm honored to work with him. Debbie Allen gave me my first job. Debbie Allen swooped me up, honey. She said, damn, that's talent. She was a little intimidated by it, too. <laughs> All we do is act a fool when we get together. We're so happy that we're talented and successful. <laughs> I'd be like, how you doing, girl? She said, I'm famous. I said, girl, yeah, I'm famous, girl. That's a good girlfriend you can act a fool with. Debbie has done so much for the community. She has done so much. Oh my gosh, I just got a um, text from Debbie. We're supposed to be doing a project. You gotta be patient for it, y'all. We're working so hard on it. It's called Ventura Boulevard. And it's a, 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 a sort of a mocking of Sunset Boulevard with Gloria Swanson. But we're still working on it. We're trying to make it like Jackie's back too. <laughs> oh my God. Sit your ass down. Oh, happy and shit. He got his copy. Go on, baby. What can you say about Debbie Allen? She's an amazing activist. She's giving back. Who are we if we don't give back? If you bored, you go find a kid to mentor. 
You don't have to adopt them like I did, but go, go join a, a community group. Do something. Go to your meetings, town, town, what do you call it? town hall meetings. Go and lift your voice up, y'all. Let me tell you something. Now, we didn't think we were going to have to fight this hard anymore after the 60s. Taking the hoses and the dogs and the billy clubs. They got bullets now. Okay? Take care of yourselves. Wow. It's amazing times. But God, I'll tell you something. I'm an optimist. We gonna be just fine. Cause we gonna stick together. I ain't talking about just black folks. White, yellow, green, purple, pink. I knew a pink man one time. <laughs> Hell, you laughing at, he was cute. <laughs> yeah, honey, back in the day, I didn't care what color they were. I was like, come here. So um, here at Ellington, we have our own definition of an artist citizen. And I heard how you brought up being a um, citizen, so I wanted to know what your definition of an artist-citizen was. Anita Simone said, an, an artist has a responsibility to speak to the times, to protest against the forces that bring evil into this world, and y'all know what we're dealing with now. It is your duty as an artist to create art, performance, writings. Write your feelings down every day, every night, so you can be free. I tell everything. Yeah, I did it. Would I do it again? No. But ain't no shame in my game. I lay it on the slab. You have a responsibility. You look in the mirror every morning after you brush your teeth. You take two minutes and stand there and look in your own eyes and say, I love myself. I'm important. I'm worthy. I'm somebody in this world. Next question. Damn. OK. <laughs> Baby. Loud. Sorry, I can hear you. I have always wanted to be creative. Last year, I've taken stand-up comedy classes, I've started acting classes, but I'm 33 and I feel like I'm too old, I got my good government job, and I just need to keep doing what I'm doing, um, and I just don't feel the courage to take the kind of risk you took right after college to, to, to go off to New York and try to do something. All right, sit your ass down, let me tell you. That. He can't wait to tell everybody. James Lewis told me to sit my ass down. <laughs> uh, I saw Lena Horne do her one-woman show on Broadway, The Lady and Her Music. And she was 65 years old. And one thing jumped off that stage to me that night. And she said it with such confidence. Ooh, I loved her. She said, it's never too late to feel good about yourself. I was like, damn, really? No, baby. Don't you let nothing stop you from doing what you love to do. You hear me? That's the answer to your question. You do what makes you happy. Don't call me, I ain't coming to see you, but you... <laughs> I'm gonna be looking for you. <laughs>